their lofty goal. I have, a, I always have a lofty goal. Um, it's, it's always about the quality <laughs> for me. Um, so we're going to do kind of a hefty download on stress, how to rewire stress. And then towards the latter portion of this practice, we're going to tap into more of the experiential portion of what we can start to do to quote unquote, rewire the stress response. So bear with me. I think we are gonna hit past the hour mark. I'm sure we are, but I promise not to go more than 15 minutes over. If you do have to leave, that's fine. Um, you're gonna be doing the recording for this anyways, but if you can stay, I highly encourage you to stay for those extra 15 minutes because we are gonna be doing the experimental, the experiential practices that really help you directly get the download of how to start to do this work on your own and really train your stress responses because that's really what this is all about. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, let's see here. Here we go. Share. That was easy. Play from start. All right. All right, well, welcome to Rewire the Stress Response. My main objective for today's practice is to give an overall view of what stress is, what is the actual definition of it, look at the brief history of its origins and especially of our main um, perception of why we think stress is negative, how that came about and how we can start to kind of rewire those mechanisms as well. And so by looking deeply and questioning, is stress a risk or is it a benefit? It is both, but how do we start to look at it differently? And that helps us to change our experience of it. And then we're going to tap into some of the anatomy of stress, looking deeply at what the main systems of stress are. So you understand actually what's going on in your body when stress is occurring, what hormones are involved. And um, then we're going to go into the role of stress in our health and well-being. And the, then looking at yoga psychology's view of stress and especially of the mind. And then the latter portions of practice, looking at how we can start to begin to the process of transformation with stress. Um, and then looking at some of the main practices you can begin to apply on the regular basis to, to work with your own stress management. We all have stress regardless of how well we're managing it, it's inevitable. And then we're gonna look at some main breathing practices that we can do to start to train our autonomic nervous system in both directions, which is really fun. Um, so let's get right into it here. Um, for those of you I've not met, my name is Evan. I'm a yoga therapist. I'm based in Aspen, Colorado. I'm the founder of Soroka Yoga Therapy, and I'm the author of Yoga Therapy for Diabetes. Yeah, I can say that because the book is being published now. It's coming out next month, the end of next month. You can get it on Amazon. So I can now tell you about this looming secret that I've had for the last two years that I've been writing a book. And those of you that are used to taking my class uh, understand why I have been kind of like MIA. Well, writing a book basically is like having a child. It takes all of your time. So... This is my main question too. I want you to just take a moment, ask yourself, well, why are you here? I assume that you're here because there's a level of curiosity about what stress is and, and what you can start to do about it. Maybe it's something that you are challenged with. And then I wanna posit another question, which is what does happiness look like to you? Okay, what if I were to tell you that happiness and stress were positively correlated, meaning that the more stress we have in our lives, it's statistically proven that the happier we are. Now, let's just take a pause, a second back, talking about stress as something that is going to help us derive more meaning out of our lives, that the challenges are what transform us for the better. So that there is a positive correlation with stress and with receiving greater happiness, joy, and fulfillment in our lives. So for today, we're gonna to go through some 
basically like downloads of how to increase our knowledge to how to experience and also adapt to stress. And that this is overall going to lead us to a greater sense of self-empowerment, that we have an idea through our mind and through the direct experience of our bodies that we can handle it, that we trust that we can take it on and that we can dedicate a portion of our lives towards managing it and using it as perhaps a means of greater meaning and even happiness and joy in our lives. So let's look at kind of like why there is such a negative connotation of stress. The word stress, the, the etiology of the word, um, oops, sorry, of the word comes from a, a term that relates to metallurgy. And, and metallurgy is our ability to adapt under intent, or it was the ability to shape metal under intense strain. And, and so the, the term of strain and malleability really were like, they were merged together as one that in order to transform something, it had to be put under intense strain. And then Hans Selye in the 1930s, it's really kind of, I included him because he's like the founder of how we see stress today in the 1930s this is obviously a later picture of him but he was he was an early laboratory uh student and he was experimenting with lab rats had nothing to do with studies on stress he was basically really bad at handling lab rats so goes the story and like most uh most experiments you have a placebo group or like a control group, and then you have another group that you're actually testing on. And so what was happening is that he was so bad at handling these rats that he was dropping them, he was putting them under intense pressure and strain, he was chasing them around um, the laboratory. And what ended up happening, long story short, is that all of these rats, including the ones in the control group that were just being injected with saline, so placebo, um, they all just developed ulcers and ultimately died. And so what he <laughs> derived from these experiments is that it wasn't what he was doing, it was the actual, the, the pressure and the strain that he was putting under these animals. And then it, what ended up happening is that because of this, um, these animals were, creating diseases and then eventually they were they were dying. So the term stress became a novel term to refer to any physical or mental strain, trauma, anything that essentially happens to you that you don't want to happen. Um, and say, you know, he, he knew that this wasn't correct. And that's why in like the 1970s, he came about saying that you know, there is a positive stress, it's called eustress, and there's a negative stress as de-stress. But at that point, this term stress as something negative had really already latched on as something that could essentially kill you and to be avoided at all costs. Um, but he did spend the latter years of his life really trying to rewrite that wrong or that misinformation about what in, in essence stress was. And so his definition of stress was that stress is the non-specific response of the body to any demand for change. Let's just pause for a moment there and reread that, that it's the non-specific response of the body to any demand for change, which to me, I don't know about to you, but to me that really implies adaptability, okay? Adaptability. So stress can be an asset or it can be a risk. What largely determines the distinction is mindset and perception. And so we're going to go into mindset and per perception. This is just another quote from Dr. Sadie, which I love because it, it, it really reinforces what I'm saying here is that adopting the right attitude can transform a negative stress into a positive one. So talking about stress is almost as insane as talking about spirituality, um, talking about <laughs> things that really, um, they're just, they're ambiguous. Um, there are so many things that, that can be encompassed under the term stress. 
Um, but I've just generalized like three main ways that we can start to look at it is, is good. Good stress is the kind that actually is going to, to promote benefit. It's going to increase re resilience. These are chosen challenges. They are helping us to achieve goals, performance. We can turn them on and off. Another example of this would be like um, chosen stress, like going, I, I don't know about you guys, but I hate scary movies, but I have a lot of friends and even my husband, he loves scary movies. And like, I'm like, no way guys, no way am I gonna go to a scary movie? Not that we're going to movies these days, but you know what I mean? Popping on a scary movie. I don't see that as not joyful, but for some people, they like to put themselves under that kind of good stress because <laughs> it's enjoyment for them. And they know that they can turn it off. The same thing for like riding a roller coaster, for instance. Tolerable stress, I, I think about all my friends that are watching this that have diabetes like myself, it's like being diagnosed with the disease. Um, it's something that we do not choose, but we have resources to manage, to cope and to resolve, hopefully, right? Toxic stress is also something we do not choose. Um, it's but it becomes toxic when we lack resources, we feel helpless and alone. Um, it creates negative mental and physical uh, side effects. And ultimately it feels inescapable that we have no control over it. There's nothing that we can do about it. And that's what starts to make stress the, let's just say a causative factor in the development of, of disease, okay? So this was an interesting study um, that I, I just was getting into the other day. And it was basically a study that was recently done um, in 2013. And they had two groups looking at these two different statements, basically, that the effects of stress are negative and should be avoided versus the, that experiencing stress improves health and vitality. And in this study, um, they were asking certain students to be put under experiences of intense strain. And the ones that had been basically um, fed the information and given the information that stress is negative and that it should be avoided, their performance was way down. And actually all the stress hormones that elicit the negative responses of stress like cortisol, epinephrine, so on and so forth, they were higher. Whereas the secondary group that were experienced, that they were fed the information that ex or primed with the information that experiencing stress improves health and vitality. Although they were still experiencing a level of stress because anytime that we're active or activated, like right now in this moment, as I'm giving you this information, I'm in a stress response because I have to be active. Um, but these people, what ended up happening is that they performed a lot better and the rate of stress hormones that were being produced was dramatically decreased. So it's just very interesting how priming ourselves with the mindset really has a, a huge benefit in the long term. So bottom line, this is not news to any of us that a reasonable amount of stress helps people grow. We grow into well-adapted human beings equipped to respond to life challenges and unforeseen optical obstacles. I think about the most interesting people I've met in my life are the ones that have been challenged the most. Uh, another example would be about our own immunity. Um, well-developed immune systems are the ones that have been put under strain or stress. Granted, we could go into discussion about autoimmune disease, which is a whole other um, side of, of immunity and stress, but th that's not the main topic of this discussion. So bottom line is that under pressure, beautiful things can be created. And it really, you know, goes into this idea of resilience that so many of us are talking about in the wellness community and the medical community, that resilience is something that, it, you know, it's both physiological and psychological. Physiological, as we're going to go into in a moment, in the sense that a healthy nervous system is one that can bounce back and that can weave seamlessly through activation and passivity and psychological in the sense that we can start to derive meaning and benefit from our challenges. Um, 
it, resilience also implies a, a facility of returning back to baseline without a dramatic energetic cost. This is something called allostasis. And as I just mentioned, it's also to derive benefit and meaning and to grow from our challenges. Um, and, and I know we can go in greater depth about it. Like there are some horrible things that happen in this world. Um, and, and how are we supposed to derive meaning and benefit from the things that um, really have no reason um, and no one deserves? But bottom line is if we can start to make a cognitive shift and see that our challenges are opportunities for our own personal growth, that it helps us to let go of some of that um, that lingering trauma that can um, persist. So a healthy brain shows resilience and recovery after a stressful event or a stressful experience is over. And, and really that's part of this, this problem with chronic stress in the modern world is that we're not turning off our stress responses. We're not recovering, um, be it because of lifestyle, be it because of consistent stress. There are many ways that we're incurring stress, but um, health and resilience are really intertwined with our ability to turn it off. And really that's how we adapted biologically and evolutionarily, is to be able to turn it off. So let's define what a stressor is. That it is also very ambiguous because it is literally anything in your world that takes your body out of homeostasis or out of balance, basically the same thing. Okay. Our bodies are constantly, we have no idea, but they are constantly regulating, whether it's catabolism, metab our metabolic rate, our anabolism, we're building, we're uh, reducing, we're <laughs> digesting. It's insane, just the, the beauty and the orchestration that's occurring without our, our cognitive processes being involved, okay? And so a stressor is anything that happens outside of our world, the outside of our physical body, as well as in, within the body, as well, that, that takes us out of that homeostasis and that brings us and that our stress response is what the internal process that brings us back into balance. So we're not always aware of it um, when we're stressed out, but there is so much going on behind the scenes that's bringing us back into the sense of homeostasis and balance because change is constant. So I want to drop in and, you know, Give, give the best I can uh, lip service to what's going on here um, with the stress systems of the body. I am a yoga therapist. I am not a doctor, but I have done quite a bit of research on this. And this is just a brief overview of what the main systems are that are involved. And they're important for you to know, for you to understand why stress is happening and what's going on internally when stress is happening. So one of the main systems is the HPA axis. The HPA axis is known as the hypothalamus or it is the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. And it's a combination of both our nervous and endocrine systems. So it's really fascinating because the HPA axis is basically like during a stress response, it's what produces the hormone cortisol. And cortisol is what helps us with our daily circadian rhythm. It's what gives us energy throughout the day, but it's also what gives us and derives energy over the longer duration. So let's say that like um, ancestrally, we were running from a saber toothed tiger. I know it's a little cliche, but it's just the best example I can give you right now. And that we needed extra energy to go over a longer duration to get where we needed to go. Or in times of fast without food, right? So these are, uh, these are regulatory processes that are helping us to have more energy for longer durations. Um, and, and then basically what happens is that after the body is produced, sufficient cortisol, there's a negative feedback me uh, mechanism and negative in this case is positive. This negative feedback mechanism turns off the stress response. Um, but what happens in the case of chronic stress is that because the HP axis is turned on consistently and it does not turn off, this negative feedback loop is what it's called, 
doesn't turn off. And what it ends up happening is that cortisol ends up kind of exhausting itself. And this is when we start to see like lots of issues, um, like with anxiety and depression. And um, as you can see, as I'm relating to that, because the last note here is that cortisol actually buffers the impact of adrenaline or epinephrine. It really just depends where you live, what you call it. Um, in the United States, we call it epinephrine. And so we're going to talk about that next, but cortisol helps to buffer that and to smooth it out. So epinephrine or adrenaline, it increases our heart rate. It, it really makes us like kind of shaky. Those of you that have diabetes, you can experience this with like hypoglycemia. Um, it helps to buffer that impact. Like in, in, anxiety has that same feeling to it. So when our cortisol reserves are exhausted, it really, um, it, 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 it makes us more prone to the effects of adrenaline. So the other main player in our stress response is the sympathetic nervous system. This is a subdivision of the autonomic nervous system. It increases our heart rate and our blood pressure. Um, it shuts down digestion, increases respiration, produces epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are the hormones that are responsible um, for, in this case, for producing glucose from storage. So think about the sympathetic nervous system as what's going to provide energy for immediate need. This is commonly known as like our fight or flight response, but we're going to talk about this in a little bit, how it's not quite that. Um, this is just the part of your nervous system that helps you be activated. Like I said before, in this moment, as I'm presenting this information to you, I'm sympathetically activated. I have to be sympathetically activated. Hopefully you're the opposite. You're more parasympathetically <laughs> activated in this moment so you can receive this information. Um, but bottom line, this is what helps us get stuff done. But when it's overly activated, this is when we have an issue. So the parasympathetic nervous system is the other branch of the autonomic nervous system. It's the cohort or the, uh, the counterpart to the sympathetic branch. This is what balances everything out. So whereas the sympathetic branch produces energy, this parasympathetic nervous system helps us store and build energy for later use when we're sleeping, we're in parasympathetic activation. Um, when we're digesting our food, we should optimally be in parasympathetic so we can actually digest our food. Um, and um, it, it also helps us to, part of that negative feedback loop of turning off the production of stress hormones. It, for those of you with diabetes, um, it's important to note that this is the part of our nervous system that helps elicit the production of insulin. So if you have type two diabetes and you're also experiencing a lot of stress, or if you're type one and you're having insulin resistance still, like you're taking insulin and it's not working very well, it, it could be a matter of needing to elicit and to create more of resilience between the branches of your autonomic nervous system. So allostasis is, it's basically, this is how I see resilience. This is our ability to maintain stability through change, okay? There's two different types of allostatic responses. So stress happens, um, number one response is to adapt, right? Uh, many of us adapt through, ch through stress. We experience stress and we know what to do. We can learn how to downregulate our nervous system. We learn to like maybe exercise that helps to manage our stress, to meditate, to breathe, um, to find benefit in the challenges. And then the op opposite spectrum of this is to not adapt. Um, especially if we're already overloaded, uh, there's no ad adaptation. And this is when we have lots of issues over the longer duration of chronic stress. And we start to see that stress is a negative. So stress is both garlic, vine. something that you create or something that's uh, psychological. And it's also something that's um, actual. So one end it's perceived, one end it's, it's something that's physiologically occurring in your body. So every time our mind decides that something is threatening and consistently so, our adaptive responses, 
i.e. allostasis, our ability to try to bring everything back into balance that was created to turn on and off, it stays on and this is when it becomes a problem. So this is just a nice graph um, as I was perusing the internet today that I found of, of just how we can start to conceive of what ends up happening when our body is put under too much allostasis without applying uh, practices that are gonna help us promote regeneration. Um, and this is what's called allostatic load, okay? So the more that we're perceiving things as stressful, whether that's from our environment or major life events or something that we do not choose happening to us and often reliving that psychologically, there is a perceived sense of threat, okay? From that, there are behavioral responses. And then individual differences, whether we're pre, we have predispositions, there's genetics, there's de de developmental, there's life experience, and all of this coincides with a physiological response, regardless of it being something that is actual or something that we are creating due to our perception of something being threatening. Our body does not discern this and still creates the same stress hormones, the straight, same chemicals, and our bodies have to go through allostasis. And this process of allostasis into adaptations, trying to recreate balance, creates allostatic load. And over the duration of time, as you can see, the rope begins to fray. And this is why we start to see a negative connotation with stress and the development of other disorders, whether that's the development of disease, um, or aggravating factors, comorbid disorders that go along with having a disease. So bottom line, you know, like if stress is one real, because we're feeling it, if we're feeling it, it's got to be real, right? But it's also, it's perceived. And so it's known that if we can change the perception of a threat to a non-threat, we can start to control or at least influence what our body's biological processes are doing, whether we are experiencing stress or not experiencing stress or finding a benefit out of stress versus it being something that's detrimental and um, that, that, that makes us feel like we have no control. So bottom line, this is just like a very brief overview of what's going on. All the information that we take in through our senses, those are five major senses here, however we see the outside world, are taken in through a part deep in the midbrain, part of our limbic system. The amygdala is what it's like the filter that takes in information from the senses relate the amygdala then relates that information to the hippocampus and the hippocampus is like the repository of all of your memory and past experiences and the amygdala and the hippocampus talk and the hippocampus is like yeah that sucked last time you know and the, then the amygdala is like all right that sucks so i'm gonna have a stress response and then amygdala tells the hypothalamus all right tell the rest of your body to send out stress hormones but if the amygdala talks to the hippocampus and there is a non-perception of threat then we're able to nullify the stress response and that's really Im important in our ability to to truly, let's just say, influence how we are perceiving the world, how we are managing stress in our lives. And it's challenging because look, there's a lot of information that's going on in our bodies that we're not always privy to. We're not always aware to what we're feeling, right? The experience of anxiety is very similar to the experience of excitement. And if we're able to cognitively reframe that I'm anxious to I'm excited or I'm experiencing anxiety to 
I'm actually really excited or I'm angry to, I'm actually like, I really care about this thing. You know, how do we make this shift in our brain? And it's often our own awareness of what our thoughts, what the physical sensations are in our body, what kinds of emotions are present and how that all elicits behavior. Because if our perception is not clear, it's going to be automatic and we're going to be responding from, um, from past experiences, from reaction, instead of with clear discernment. And really this is what yoga is all about is our ability to create that separation between what we're observing and what is actually real. And even that discernment between what we're feeling and what is actually real. <laughs> because it, we often think we're feeling it, so it has to be real. And so actually this is, um, this is the yogic model of the mind. It's not the Vedic model of the mind. Those of my yoga students out there, um, you may know the distinction, um, but this is, this is a common model used in yogic trainings of the chariot. And it's helpful for us to kind of have these models for us to understand bigger complex um, concepts. Uh, about what's going on. So this is just basically what I just showed you, but from a yogic standpoint. And so the chariot with the horses is basically like the analogy for this. Um, you see the, the horses, they, they represent the senses, okay? And the reins are the mind, the guy who's holding the reins, this is the higher intellect. And then the passenger, well, this is consciousness. And we can say that there's universal consciousness, but there's also individual consciousness. And according to yoga, we, we have universal consciousness, but each and every one of us possesses um, an individual consciousness known as the jiva. And self-mastery is this. Self-mastery is the ability to be the passenger in charge of the direction of the senses. The opposite is stress. When we are driven by stress, our identification lies with the senses. And wherever our senses take us, that's where the rest of uh, our attention goes. That's the rest where our mind's gonna go. That's where our intellect's gonna go. And then the other part of us, that higher conscious, that, that higher knowing, it's completely lost in the mix. So yoga is really this process of, of, of not only reawakening this understanding and being able to discern the distinction between what we're seeing, feeling, thinking, and doing, and the sense of consciousness, but it's the empowerment to be, <laughs> to be the charioteer. <laughs> That, that you're not just going along for the ride, like letting your senses take you wherever you want to go. You, you're, you're ultimately directing that experience. So there's um, one of the two main concepts I, I just want to remind you of, if you know of, or if this is new to you, to introduce you to, and, and these are two Sanskrit terms um, coming from yogic tradition, yogic philosophy. The first one is avidya, avidya. Avidya basically means the absence of truth. It, it loosely translates as is misunderstanding or ignorance. And bottom line, that ignorance is the that misbelief that you are the change, cir changing circumstances and conditions around you, that you are stress, right? That you're not consciousness, you're not higher intellect, that you're stress, you're the, all the stuff that's happening to you. Okay, and dukkha, dukkha is the direct experience of a vidya. However, we experience it in our bodies as suffering, whether that's pain, whether that's anxiety, whether that's depression, whether that's illness, um, it's, it's loosely translates as bad space. So these are two concepts really to understand. They're essentially the same thing, but one is the overall thing, which is a vidya, which is 
the main misunderstanding that we think we are what we aren't and we don't even know we are what we are. And dukkha, which is the actual physical experience of that bad negative space. And so keep going back to yoga because this is a, a wonderful kind of depiction. It's all these deities in yoga and it's, it's not about religiousness. It's really about deriving direct meaning from the representation. And this is one that my teachers always bring up, which is Ananta. And Ananta is, he's the snake. And he is the epitome, or he or she, I don't know, um, of, of stability and ease, of resilience in many ways. You can see in this picture, he's holding Vishnu. He's holding a whole lot of other people. I don't even know who the rest of these guys are in here, but he, you can see he's floating on the ocean and he's holding Vishnu, who is the holder of the whole world. I couldn't find um, any pictures of him. There are some traditional ones with him. He's got like the whole globe on his head. So he's holding the whole world on the ocean <laughs> and he's able to find that stability to hold everything, but also be buoyant enough to float. And really that's what to me in essence and, and what yoga tradition is trying to teach us is that life is about adaptability through change that we have to be vigilant but we also have to surrender we need to be stable but we need to be we need to have ease right and that change is inevitable stress is a part of all of our lives and the more attached and identified we are with changing circumstances and conditions the more that we're going to suffer the more that we're going to have that dukkha so now let's get into stress as adaptation. This is kind of getting into the nitty gritty of how we can actually rewire stress response. So science is, this is, isn't this a wonderful picture? This is a picture of the brain. Um, science is showing us that there are many ways for us to influence how we perceive stress. One is from the top down with, uh, with us being able to educate ourselves and to set intentions and have positive affirmations and these kinds of things. But the secondarily is from the bottom up. And, and this is where we start to see really the benefit from um, our own yogic practices of breathing specifically. And we're going to go into that in just a little bit. But even, you know, yoga asana, um, helping us to improve our interoception. And our interoception is this ability to sense and to feel correctly what's going on in our body. Really, that's what's developed in many ways throughout, um, through a complete yoga practice. And so part of even that top down that I first referred to of intention goes back into this deriving benefit and meaning from our challenges. So if we can start to cognitively reframe stress as something that's negative, something that's happening to us and start to see it as, and I know this is kind of hard to hear it when you're in the midst of stress, but it's something that is an opportunity for growth and for um and for you to improve yourself and to derive more meaning from your life experiences, that it really can start to change the way that we're seeing our challenges. I'll be honest with you, um, th this morning, um, or actually it was yesterday, um, I had created this PowerPoint uh, last year and getting all excited for doing this presentation and looking everywhere in my files I could not find the presentation and so after like a half an hour of kind of frantically searching I could have gone 
and spiraled into a huge stress response of, oh no, I'm going to have like 12 hours of having to create a whole new PowerPoint. And instead, the benefit finding cognitive reappraisal in that situation was, well, hey, I know a lot more now than I did last year when I created this PowerPoint. I'm just going to do it all over again and I'm going to do it better. Lux luckily, I had the luxury of time to do that. We don't always have the luxury of time. Okay. So if you guys remember that slide, a few slides back about the senses and about the amygdala, um, you know, the activity in the region of the amygdala suggests that it really, it elicits what's going on in our fear responses. Did anyone see that movie Free Solo? Um, I forget the guy's name, but the guy who like climbs all these crazy mountains without a rope on and they were doing all these CAT scans of his brain came to realize that he like literally had no amygdala <laughs> or he had a very, very small amygdala. So he was not experiencing very much fear at all. But other studies have also shown that for, for and I, I can't reference it exactly because I was just reading a bunch of information of it. I'll have to look it up again after we do this presentation and, and try to source it for you. But it was something to the extent that, oh, you know what it was? It was in James Nestor's book, Breath. If you guys have not got that book, it's great. Um, that that they were doing all these studies on taking out like people's and they, I mean, scientists were doing studies on taking out or um, disrupting the amygdala from working and realizing or that people actually were not experiencing fear, but then they were doing something specific, which was inhibiting their breath and those same feelings of anxiety were coming up. So we know that the breath has a direct relationship with what's going on in this region of the brain. Um, and that act, activity in the region of the amygdala suggests that a person's rapid breathing rate may trigger brain states like anxiety or feeling states like anger or fear. Conversely, it may be possible to reduce fear and anxiety by slowing down the breath. Breathing is the one thing we have to consciously change our autonomic systems, to consciously change a part of our body that is automatic, that we typically have no control over. It's something that we actually have control over. And that is why breathing is one of the most beneficial things we can do, whether that's through a yoga practice and consciously breathing as we're moving our bodies or in pranayama practice, or in other ways that stretch and challenge our breathing. Like I, I, I'm a, a cyclist and I'm very active outside something that uh, was brought to my attention in James Nestor's book um, on breath was about mouth breathing and how even during intense exercise, um, it is more beneficial to keep your mouth closed because it helps to keep the balance of your nervous system and your heart rate so that you're not ex excessively expending energy. And it really helps the, uh, to optimize the gaseous exchange of oxygen and um, CO2. So the secondary player here, and that's rewiring the stress response is through the vagus nerve. And I'm sure most of you have heard about the vagus nerve. Um, the vagus nerve, it's the 10th cranial nerve. It's known as also known as the great wandering protector. And basically the vagus nerve extends from your brain and it, it is connected to almost every major organ system of your body. I just love this image because it really just shows you how deeply ingrained the vagus nerve is within every organ of the body. Hey, Janet, do you mind um, muting your computer, please? Oh, my God. You've been hearing me this whole time. I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. I just, just came up with your name, so I know who it was. It's good to see you, though, or hear your voice. Um, so the vagus nerve, it basically controls the parasympathetic nervous system. 
Okay. This is our ability to influence parasympathetic predominance. Remember how we we're talking about the nervous system, they're sympathetic, which is um, the part of our nervous system that helps us derive energy and to be ready to go on the go. But we also need the parasympathetic to help us rest and digest and rejuvenate and to build. Okay. The vagus nerve is in control of basically both, but it is part of parasympathetic. So it's like the, the lever of the stress response. It helps us to downregulate and upregulate. Downregulation is to move towards parasympathetic and upregulate is to move towards sympathetic. So it helps us also to turn our organs on and off. But what happens is that when we have high allostatic load, when we're under constant both acute and chronic stress, the the ability of our vagus nerve to function, um, it's depleted, it, its strength is depleted. And this is what we call low vagal tone. So low vagal tone is associated with low heart rate variability. This is our ability to, um, to move in between sympathetic and parasympathetic seamlessly. And it's also associated with a high stress response. So training the vagus nerve to turn on and off and also to train the autonomic nervous system with breathing is one of our prime ways that we can begin to train these autonomic processes and to help us be more resilient and adaptable to stress so that we don't go into a full-fledged um, <laughs> uh, sympathetic overdrive with every little thing that goes wrong in our lives that we're able to be able to not only take a deep breath in the moment, right, that we're doing our practice, but that we can take a deep breath as we're experiencing stressors and to be able to have that moment of pause and be, remember that, that guy in the back of the chariot who's driving the horses to be in control of our senses versus the senses being in control of us. Okay, so there are many ways to do this, but I've kind of laid out two main ways to do this. There's direct and indirect ways to train the nervous, the vagus nerve. Direct, is through diaphragmatic breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing are many ways um, to breathe in, but diaphragmatic breathing is most associated with an abdominal breath versus a chest breath. And this is a nice uh, diagram of it because it does show both where the shape change is happening on the inhale and the exhale. So bottom line, we do not have lungs in our stomach but we can direct a shape change in specific areas. And also, as we do diaphragmatic breaths, the majority of the parasympathetic nerves are located in the lower lobes of the lungs. So this is why um, more of a belly breath is beneficial for training the sympathetic nervous system to turn on, okay? Also lengthening the exhale. So every time, the, the abdomen draws in and the diaphragm lifts on the exhale. You can see that on the right here, the molecules of our breath are passing through the lungs and this is increasing. It's, it's, it's helping to increase this relaxation response. So just as an inhale and the abdomen helps to reach those lower lobes of the lungs, the exhale, is something that's going to be even more calming and relaxing. Although, let me just have a side note that exhaling can be also, um, it can invoke some strain, especially if you're challenged with your breath. So the rule of thumb is never to force your breathing. Um, so this is a reducing approach. Those of you that are in yoga therapy uh, training, this is like a langana approach. I'm not going to go into great detail with that. This is, this is just a, a free masterclass, guys. I can't give it all away. Um, and, and then alternate nostril exhales, segmented exhales, like uh, doing a two-part exhale, three-part exhale, anything that's gonna elicit more of an exhalation and do it with ease. Also chanting is a great strategy directly to do this. And then indirectly, at least for yogic techniques, um, 
is this idea of interoception once again it's like body scan meditations or to lie on your back and just scan the back of your body to scan the front of your body to scan inside your body yoga nidra is a great tool and also witnessing the fact of your natural breath so these are two ways for you to begin to train your nervous system um, to train the vagus nerve more specifically through the down regulation of the autonomic nervous system now, that's not just the only way to train stress. We think that it's all about calming ourselves down when bottom line, it's really not just about calming ourselves down because we need a healthy nervous system needs to be able to be strong and adaptive. And need, I think of Ananta again of, of stable and ease. So we need to be able to also stimulate and activate. Yes, it's true. The majority of us are already hyper activated, um, but by consciously pushing our nervous system towards sympathetic through specific breathing practices, this also can help us to stimulate and activate and train our nervous system to be more resilient. Um, so here are just some like a dichotomy of opposites that we can start to understand in training the autonomic nervous system to find more balance between the opposite sides is stimulation versus pacification, inhalation versus exhalation. So inhale is inherently more stimulated and activating. Inhaling into the chest is going to be the same thing. If you were to do an inhale into your chest, it's going to be more awakening and stimulating. Um, solar versus lunar, uh, right brain versus left brain, sympathetic versus parasympathetic. These are all universal paradigms that help us to understand the most subtle aspects of what we call homeostasis or balance, or even a little bit deeper than that, that seer or that consciousness who's riding in the back of the chariot right? It, it's finding the balance between these opposites. So we can allow energy to move harmoniously in our body. And through this harmonious energy moving through our body, we achieve health and well-being because prana or life force is flowing more evenly. Okay. So, wow, I'm very impressed with myself that we've gotten through this. I wanted now to take some time for the remainder of our practice and to go through and I'll direct you through some specific breathing exercises um, so you can experience a little bit of everything. Now I'm, I'm doing this consciously so that you're not gonna walk out of here and be like, super wired for the rest of the night. We're gonna work with some stimulation and activation, and then we're gonna to start to pacify, and then we'll leave balance from here. So I'm gonna say we've got about um, 20, let's see, 20 minutes. I'm gonna see how many of these we can actually go through. Um, Karina, don't tell Gary, because he might cringe at this a little bit, um, but I really want us to get a taste of this and so what we're going to work with is um, a six second breath in and out. This is what um, just kind of like a good baseline of creating balance is with the six second breath. We're going to work with six, 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 which is inhale six, hold for six, exhale six, no pause after the exhale. And this is what we call a Brahmana technique. This is more of a stimulating technique. So we're going to do a few rounds of that. We'll pause and I want you to feel the effect physiologically in your body. And then we're going to do the opposite. We're going to do six inhale, six exhale, and then pause after the exhale for six counts. I'm going to guide you through it. And this is more of the lunar or the parasympathetic. Um, and then we're going to do a stimulating Kriya called Kapalabhati. This is a great way to uh, practice first thing in the morning to awaken, but also doing this in a balanced way can also be very grounding. Um, I put it in red so you can see that it is, it's, it's awakening. And then I think we're just gonna have time to do an alternate nostril Nadi Shodana, and I'll teach you how to do that. This is very balancing, but I want you to see that there's something called Viloma and Analoma. And the Viloma is when you're inhaling 
alternate nostril inhale. The analoma is alternate nostril exhale. These are many different ways to elicit different energetic responses. And then we're going to finish with something called Swara Yoga. This is the balancing of the nadis. So we can end the session feeling very balanced um, and in tune with energy moving through our nostrils, energy channels of the solar and the lunar moving through our bodies and to find a nice balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, so. All right. So come to a comfortable seat. The general rule of thumb with the breath is never to push your breath. As I mentioned before, breathing with the mouth closed is ideal for the optimization of gaseous exchange, but also that's just the way that we do it here in yoga, in yoga-based pranayam practices. So if you're comfortable, close your eyes, set up nice and tall. And so we're gonna first just find a breath that's even. So inhaling, and exhaling for the count of six. Why don't you start a little bit lower than that, maybe inhaling for four and exhaling for four. Now, those of you that are experienced in pranayam, you can go higher than six, maybe even eight or 10, but I'm going to stick with six because I think generally speaking, six is a great way to find balance for majority of people. Now extend your breath from four to six. So you'll inhale for the count of six. And exhale for the count of six. I'm just gonna have you sustain this for one minute. Inhale six and exhale six. Feeling of your breath is that same feeling of interoception, your own ability to feel what's going on in the body. And it also helps the mind to focus less outwardly, more inwardly focused. Now just relax your breathing, take a normal breath in and out. Notice how even just a couple minutes of six in, six out may have influenced some level of change in your body. That's physically, mentally, some level of change. So now we're gonna go to the six, six, six. So we're inhaling six, holding the inhale for six, and exhaling six, okay? We'll build up to it. So exhale here. Now inhale, six counts. Please hold just for three counts, so just half of it. Exhale for six counts. Feel the abdomen draw in. Inhale six. Pause six, or pause three, I'm sorry. Exhale six. We've got to inhale six. Hold. 
hold for six now. You just feel a little bit of a lifting of your chest. Exhale for six counts. And we're going to do three more rounds of that. So inhale for six counts. Hold for six. Exhale six. Feel the exhale initiating from the abdomen, drawing in towards the spine. Inhale six. So if you can actually try to inhale more in the chest rather than the abdomen, because it's going to have that stimulating effect that I'm referring to. Hold for six. You might even squeeze your abdomen in a little bit so you feel like the chest is the main area of expansion and exhale again for six counts. So one more round like that, inhale six. Hold, six counts, chest expands. And exhale, six. Now just take a count of six in and count of six out, no pause. I just observe the effect, how this breathing practice is a little different than the last. As I mentioned, this is more solar. And of course, we could be doing these for a long period of time. This is just to get a, a mini taste of it. Solar practice, more stimulating, more sympathetically activating. Okay, now we're gonna do six in, six out, and work with a pause after the exhale, which is six counts. And this helps to work with that elongation, um, excuse me, the pacification, the calming and the parasympathetic. So more of a lunar aspect to this breath. So wherever you're at in your breath cycle, please exhale. You're gonna inhale for the count of six. Exhale for the count of six. Now pause after your exhale, just three counts. Inhale, six. Exhale, six counts. You're counting at your own pace. It's important not to try to exhale your lungs completely, just something that feels comfortable and then pause for three counts. Good, inhale slowly without hurry, count of six. Exhale, six. Now pause for six counts. You might just even feel like your heart beat. One, two, three, four, five, six. Inhale, six. Exhale, six. Pause for six. Let's repeat that inhale, a count of six. Right into the exhale. Pause six counts. Relax, deeply calming and soothing. Inhale, six counts. Exhale, six counts. And pause, six counts. Good. 
Let's just take a normal breath in and out. And as you breathe, just easily here, observe that it's a different energy to it, kind of a different quality that one senses in the body, more soul, more lunar, the down regulation of the nervous system. Hmm. So you could take that one step further, which would be inhale six, pause six, exhale six, pause after exhale six, which would be very balancing. I wanna show you another technique called Kapalabhati. So you can go ahead and open your eyes. This is more stimulating, it's more activating. Um, there are different applications for this depending on what's going on for someone, whether um, anxiety or depression, this is something that's gonna be more stimulating. Um, so it really just depends how you'd be applying this therapeutically, but I want you to get a sense of it in your body so you can understand maybe when to use it. So I'm gonna just turn my, um, lower my camera here so you can see. So what it is, it's, a, it's an exhale, but you're focusing on your abdomen, snapping in and up. The tendency oftentimes is to push down like you want to feel there's a little bit of a lifting action. And we're going to do it um, three different ways. One is to do it really slow. And then we're going to do it a little faster. And then we're going to do it the fastest. You want to keep your mouth closed with this. I know if you've been to like a Bikram class, it's done with the mouth open. Um, but this is more traditional is to keep with the mouth closed and really to focus on this pulsation of your abdomen. So go ahead and close your eyes. We're just going to go for a minute of each and get a sense of it. So this first round, doing it like pretty slowly, maybe three seconds. You can bring your hands to the abdomen as you do it. The inhale is happening automatically, so you're not trying to inhale. Okay, and then just relax. I know that wasn't a minute, but I feel like that's a good sense already. You might notice some of the activation that I'm uh, refer referencing is like a little bit more heat in the body. I feel some heat in my body, uplifting energy perhaps. So this is a stimulating breath, but done slower, it's more balanced. So now we're gonna go a little bit faster, maybe like a second for each one. Let's just do like um, 27 pulsations of it. Okay. So take a breath in and out and you'll inhale and you'll begin. Take a nice long breath in and out. A few breaths like that, maybe six in, six out. Notice the effect again of going a little bit faster. Now we're gonna do our final round, which is the fastest you can go, but you don't wanna be mustering your whole body to get involved. So it's just pretty quick, rapid, but you can go at any point pace that feels comfortable for you. And let's go with 36 pulsations of this, okay? So just count in your mind. Okay, when you're ready. 
breath in and begin. Take a normal breath in and out. Let your breath adapt, nervous system calm down, but you could start to feel how this is very stimulating. And if we were to push this even further, maybe with some breath retention, we would start to push that sympathetic end of your nervous system to a further extreme. The difference is, is that you're consciously asking your body to make that change. Um, and so these are some techniques you can begin to apply to train your nervous system to calm, but also to stimulate. Let's do, um, the final one is Nadi Shodana. Most of you know this, but uh, it, the technology is very important of how we use the nostril as, um, as a valve. And really the benefit it, derived from this breathing technique is by doing it pro appropriately with your hands. So we're going to lift I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do it mirroring you. Okay. So traditionally we do the right hand with this. And so we create a, a, a mudra, this is called Mrigi mudra. And so the thumb and the ring finger are the players here. And so what you're going to do is take your hand up to the nose. Um, and it's an alternate nostril breath. So the throat is going to be relaxed. You're going to take your thumb and close your right nostril. And now you're going to take your ring finger up to like this where the cartilage and bone meet. And you're gonna create a valve. So you're halfway closing that nostril. And from there, that's where you're gonna allow breath to move down from, okay? So go ahead and exhale out your, let's see, this is your left nostril. Now please inhale through the left nostril valve. So still applying some pressure. And then slide your ring finger down, close the left nostril and slide the thumb up. And now you're gonna valve the right nostril and exhale out the right side. Now please inhale through the right. Excuse me, inhaling through the left mirroring you. I told you I would get it wrong. And now you're going to close the right valve, the left and exhale out the left side. Remember, you're not keeping one nostril open. It's valved. Now inhale through the left side. Close the left valve, the right and exhale out the right side. Now please inhale through the right for the count of six if you can. Close the right, valve the left and exhale out the left side for the count of six. Inhale for the count of six through the valve left nostril. Close the left, valve the right, and exhale. Exhaling out the right side. Inhale through the right, six counts. Close. And then exhale out the left for six counts, keeping a valve on that left nostril. Inhale left. Close. And you're going to exhale out the right side. Squeezing the abdomen as you exhale. Inhale through the right. And 
and exhale at the left. Please lower your hand and just take a few normal breaths here. And so what I invite you to experience is right at the nostrils, right? kind of that bridge of the nose that moves up into the septum is a sensitivity to your breath. This is considered to be a very balancing breath. It balances both sides of the autonomic nervous system. Helps to still and calm the mind. And just notice this equal flow, ideally an equal flow between the right and the left nostril. Okay, so that's all the time we have for today. Um, I'm gonna send out a video for Swara this week. It's a really helpful technique um, for, for optimizing this balance between sides. Um, but I wanted to give a time if there's any questions for answering them about how to apply these breathing practices or anything of that nature. You're welcome to unmute yourself if you like. Sorry, it's dark. Hi, Evan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Hi, Karina. Hi, sorry, it's dark. I forgot to turn the light on. Um, it's okay. Could you just give some uh, advice on how to use all these practices? Would you do them one after the other? <laughs> Probably not. Uh -huh. um, you would want to apply them uniquely for your own unique condition. So what I would recommend is choosing one that felt like it really just felt like it just made a benefit. Like it really changed something and you vibed with the effect right away. Choosing one and sticking to that for maybe a week and getting used to it. The solar breathing practices are better to be utilized in the morning, evidently, because they're more solar. You wanna have energy for the day. The lunar practices are better for the afternoon and evening as we start to move ourselves towards sleep. Balancing practices like Nadi Shodana can be done at any time of day. They can be done prior to meditation. Um, Kapalabhati is great prior to meditation as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I, like I said, I'd recommend choosing one and applying it regularly and then moving on maybe to another one or doing like the solar one in the morning and the lunar one in the evening. It's also good to know how to apply these specific to your needs. So like right before this practice of teaching you guys, instead of doing a lunar breath, I actually did something more solar, which is going to help me be present and ready to be active to present to you. So like if you're in a work situation and you're feeling sluggish or tired in the afternoon, let's say, but you have to work with some clients, doing a solar breath will be incredibly beneficial. Or if you're feeling like you need some calming, you need some grounding, you need some stability, working towards a lunar breath or even that balancing Nadi Shodana will be beneficial. But when in doubt, go for six in, six out. Put a timer on for five minutes and you're going to get a benefit out of it. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Okay, one more question. See if there is... Okay, well, let me just say that should you guys want to connect with me further, I'm going to be having, um, oh, let me just say one last thing. Sorry. Main takeaway from all of this, I just hope you take away is to have compassion, compassion for yourself, 
compassion for others, that it's not always about you, dedicate something bigger to you. That's what these practices are about, is the dedicating to something that is bigger than you, finding more purpose in your life, connecting with that higher consciousness and spirit, and that it's not all about your suffering. We can learn from our suffering and we can derive more meaning from it, but everyone is being challenged right now more than ever. And so that we can understand through our own compassion for ourselves, compassion for everyone else. And this is what it's about changing the world, okay? Through practice. So if you wanna connect with me, um, you can go to my website. Um, my email is evan at Soroka Yoga Therapy. And I've really started to activate my YouTube channel. So we're putting up a lot of videos there weekly. So if you're not subscribed, please subscribe there. And um, I'd love to connect with you all further. I'm planning on having a few more offerings um, in the next few weeks. Um, we've got uh, some classes coming up, general yoga therapy classes this week, or excuse me, this coming month, and then diabetes specific things starting in March. So um, I look forward to just reconnecting with so many of you. And thank you guys for your time. I'm sorry I've gone over, but bottom line, like, you know, I should just make all my classes 90 minutes. An hour is kind of ridiculous. So um, happy Sunday. And if any questions pop up, just, just email me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.